All right, how's everybody doing? Hotel, hey, this is Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. It is Tuesday, November 13th, 2018. And we're live right now. Finally able to get uh, Comcast fixed. I was on the phone with Comcast and working with Comcast for about four and a half hours yesterday. Had to swap out my modem because it wouldn't. I was not able to broadcast on through Zoom on Facebook Live. So I was able to finally get that fixed. So I'm back. All right. So. I want to, you know, midterm elections uh, took place last week, Tuesday, November 6th. Many of you all saw my uh, show Sunday night, the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. We have the uh, Facebook Live broadcast of it uh, here on our fan page as well. Um, but in the last couple of days, uh, this story broke. Uh, it was actually a video that went viral on Sunday. This is dealing with um, US, uh, U, a U.S. Senator from Mississippi, a white female U.S. Senator from Mississippi named uh, Cindy Hyde Smith, C-H-Y-D-E, uh, -E, Cindy Hyde Smith. She is in a runoff election against an African-American man from Mississippi, okay, named Mike Espy. And a video went viral on Sunday of her um, making comments on the campaign trail about a public hanging, okay? So we're going to talk about this because this is a crazy, crazy story. And uh, we have to also understand the history of Mississippi because um, one-eighth from 1882 to 1968, there were 4,743 lynchings that took place in this country from 1882 to 1968. And, and one eighth of them, or 581 of them, took place in Mississippi. So for a sitting U.S. Senator to make public comments like that is totally ridiculous, okay? Now she put out a, a, a brief statement about it. We're gonna share that with you. She refuses to apologize. That's the other thing. She refuses to apologize for these statements that she has made, okay? Now, everybody, share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also, all right? And what we're seeing is that in this, in this Trump era, we're seeing that uh, white people have become more emboldened in white supremacist comments also, okay? And that's very dangerous. Because if you think it's okay to say it, then at some point you're going to think it's okay to do it. All right. So this is what this is one of the things I warned warned people about about the Trump administration prior to it taking place. I was talking about this during the uh, 2016 election cycle. Okay. So let's look at this story from uh, NBCNews.com. And then African American business owners, hey, post the name of your business on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network on the audio podcast of our shows. So NBCnews.com uh, has a good article. Mississippi senator whose runoff opponent is black jokes about public hanging. OK, and um, they talk about how a video of Senator Cindy Hyde Smith, Republican, of course, Republican from Mississippi, who faces a runoff this month, November 27th, against an African-American Democrat named Mike Espy. This video show, shows her joking about attending a public hang hanging, okay? In the video, she said, if he invited me to a public hanging, I'd be on the front row. If he invited me to a public hanging, I would be on the front row. And she said this during a campaign stop in Tupelo, Mississippi. All right. So the man she was referring to was identified as a local rancher. OK, um, his name is uh, Colin Hutchinson, Colin Hutchinson. OK, but she said if he invited me to a public hanging, I would be on the front row. All right. So the runoff election uh, between Senator Cindy Hyde Smith and former Secretary of Agri Agriculture Mike Espy is later this month, November 27th. 
Okay, so the video was posted by Lamar White Jr., who is the publisher of the uh, Bayou Brief, the Bayou Brief, which is a nonprofit news site in Louisiana. And um, White told uh, Mississippi Today uh, that he did not take the video and it was recorded on November 2nd before the election. Okay, Lamar White Jr. said this. Now, Mississippi has a difficult racial history that includes 581 lynchings from 1882 to 1968. And, th and they have the most out of any state. They have the one eighth of these lynchings, 4,743 from 1882 to 1968. One eighth took place in Mississippi, okay? Mississippi, but between that period of time, Mississippi had the highest number of lynchings Mississippi is also where Emmett Till was lynched, August 28, 1955, okay, when two white men abducted him and executed him, all right? So uh, for her to say something like this, people are just stunned, okay? Now, Cindy Hyde Smith, Senator Cindy Hyde Smith, who's running to complete the final two years of the Senate term she was appointed to in March of 2018 to replace Thad Cochran, dismissed the remark in a statement Sunday night, okay? Now, in a, in a uh, she said, she released the statement to try to explain away what she said. She said, quote, in a comment on November 2nd, I referred to accepting an invitation to a speaking engagement. In referencing the one who invited me, I used an exaggerated expression of regard, an exaggerated expression of regard, and any attempt to turn this into a negative connotation is ridiculous, okay? What is an exaggerated expression of regard? I've never heard that term before. I don't know what that is. Is that, is that like a term of endearment, like using the N-word? Is that, is, that, is that what that's like? Now, this morning on Morning Joe, MSNBC, Joe Scarborough, who used to be a Republican, left the Republican Party because of Trump. Joe Scarborough talks about living in different southern cities and different southern states. And you go to MSNBC.com and you can watch the video from this morning. OK, November 13th. He said he's never heard that term. He's never he's never he's never heard it. He's never uh, heard that expression. OK. And he's heard about public hangings, but it wasn't in a good way. But he said he's never heard that type of expression, you know, used. And then uh, Eugene Robinson, who, who writes for the Washington Post, who's African-American man, he's lived in the South. He said, uh, I've haven't, I haven't heard that like saying before. I haven't heard that term before. And if they heard anything about a public hanging, it wasn't something good. So Mike Espy said uh, Senator Cindy Hyde uh, Smith's remarks show why she was unfit to represent the state of Mississippi. He said Cindy Hyde Smith's comments are reprehensible. They have no place in our political discourse in Mississippi or our country. We need, we need leaders, not dividers. And her words show that she lacks the understanding and judgment to represent the people of our state, end quote, okay? Now, NAACP national president and CEO Derek Johnson, who is from Mississippi, said in a statement that Senator Cindy Hyde Smith's, quote, decision to joke about hanging in a state known for its violent and terroristic history toward African Americans is sick, end quote. He said, he went on to say, quote, to envision this brutal and, de and degenerate type of frame during a time when black people, Jewish people and immigrants are still being targeted for violence by white nationalists and racists is hateful and hurtful, end quote. I will add to that, by Donald Trump supporters also, some of them. I would add to that by Donald Trump supporters, some of them. 
We just we just saw a story from the midterm election in Mississippi. You had this white man who went to go vote. He wore a shirt that had the Confederate battle flag on it and it had a noose. And the caption said Mississippi justice. His dumb ass was fired from his job because of that. This is in Mississippi. Okay. The racial elements of the comment were lost on a few in a state where 38% of the population is African American. And it earned a fair amount of backlash on social media as well. Okay. Now, um, she at a press at a press conference. Okay, we'll get to that in just a second. Because she was asked about the after she after she released the statement, trying to explain away her the initial comments from November 2nd. At a press conference, she was pressed more about that, about why she made the statement, things like that. I'm going to share that audio uh, with you in just a minute here, okay? So just a second. Senator Cindy, Cindy Hyde-Smith nor Mike Espy broke 50% of the votes on November 6th. This is why there is a runoff. See, elections have consequences and every vote counts. If we look at the recount taking place in Florida, we look at what's going on in Georgia, and the judge just ruled uh, to hold off on certifying the count until Friday and uh, ordered that uh, provisional ballots had to be counted, things like this. Every vote counts. People, a, lot, a lot of people don't, a lot of our people don't understand this. So neither Cindy uh, Hyde-Smith nor Mike Espy broke 50% of the votes on November 6th both eking out slightly more than 40% prompting the runoff because in some states, Florida is one of them. I mean, um, sorry, Georgia is one of them. In some states, if a candidate does not get 50% or higher of the vote, it has to be a runoff between the two top uh, vote getters. That's what's taking place in Mississippi. Now, Republican Governor Phil Bryant appointed uh, Cindy Hyde-Smith to the seat in April of 2018, and she has since earned the approval of Donald Trump, of course, who campaigned for her last month in Mississippi. That's not surprising. So Cindy Hyde-Smith was the state's agricultural commissioner and a state senator. She was a uh, Democrat until 2010 when she switched political parties. Uh, she is the first woman to represent Mississippi in Congress. Mike Espy, her opponent, would be the first African-American man to serve as a U.S. Senator from Mississippi since Reconstruction and the first Democrat since John Stennis retired in 1989. Just so we understand, Reconstruction ended in 1877. If you know a thing about the history of Reconstruction, this is right after slavery ends, 1865 to 1877, basically. And you're going to have some African Americans who become elected to Congress. Some of them former slaves. They become elected to Congress, okay? And they're Republicans, all right? Because the Republican Party was the party largely of the abolitionists. He, Mike Espy, would be the first African American man to serve as a U.S. Senator from Mississippi since Reconstruction, which ended in 1877. So African-Americans who live, so we, everybody we know who's African-American, especially in Mississippi, we need to ask them. Now, one of these people are going to be, one of these people are going to be U.S. Senator. We need to ask them, okay, do you want to vote for uh, 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 Mike Espy? Or do you want to vote for somebody who would have gone to watch a public lynching? This is a legitimate question. If you understand the history of Mississippi, 580 from 1882 to 1968, 581 lynchings took place in Mississippi more than any other state. So, uh, <laughs> it, the, the choice is pretty easy here. Okay. I'm just saying. All right. And people say, well, we don't know what their policies are, things like that. Uh, whatever it is, I'm pretty sure his policies are better than hers. We can look at the policies. 
But I'm, I'm pretty sure his policies are much better than hers for African Americans, period. <laughs> you know, I just, I haven't seen any of their policies. I just have a sneaky suspicion. His policies are much better than hers, okay? <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna post a link. I'm gonna post a link here on the thread of the broadcast. Um, okay, this is from NBCnews.com. I'm, I'm gonna share some other articles with you. Okay, this is from NBCnews.com. Um, Mississippi Senator, whose runoff opponent is black, jokes about public hanging, right? <laughs> it was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. All right. So now just today, the story was released. Washington Post has a story about this. NBC News has a story about this, about hate crimes in this country. And hate crimes increased in 2017 by 17%. That story came out today. Okay. Um, and we'll we'll pull we'll pull this one up here as well. Hate crimes in America spiked 17% last year, FBI says. So here you have a U.S. Senate. I mean, do people understand how important the U.S. Senate? I, I really don't think people understand how important the U.S. Senate is, okay? Because the U.S. Senate doesn't just, they don't just vote and confirm Supreme Court nominations. They vote and confirm federal court nominations, the federal judges. And that's a lifetime appointment as a federal judge. And more cases go before the federal courts than go before the U.S. Supreme Court. The annual report showed there were 7,175 biased crimes, which targeted 8,493 victims based on their race and sexual orientation reported in 2017. This just came out, this article just came out today. This, the report came out today, okay? The FBI reported more than a 17% rise in hate crimes across America, officials said Tuesday, November 13th, the third consecutive year, the numbers have increased. I wonder why. There have been 6,121 hate crimes reported in 2016, 5,850 5, such offenses in 2015, and 5,479 in 2014. So 2015 was more than 2014, 2016 was more than 2015, and 2017 was more than 2016. The 17.2% .2 spike follows increases of 4.6% and 6.7% in the previous two years. The hate crime totals were comprised of 59.6%, 59.6% acts against a victim based on race, 20.6% uh, because of religion, and 15.8% because of sexual orientation, the FBI said. This report is a call to action and we will heed that call, said the fake acting attorney general, uh, Matt Whitaker, who was installed based upon the uh, um, the Government uh, Vacancy Act, but it's unconstitutional because he's not approved by the U.S. Senate. So he's the fake acting attorney general. Any, any action he takes is unauthorized and illegal. Okay, he's the, he, 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 was, he was appointed by Trump who skipped over the, 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 skipped over the chain of command, skipped over the succession, should have gone to Rod Rosenstein who is second in command, skipped over all that, skipped over the uh, inspector general, skipped over all of that and get, and get this guy who's not even consented confirmed, okay? Because his views fall in line with what Trump wants to do to choke the Mueller investigation or shut it down. Okay, so check out this article as well. The Department of Justice top priority is to reduce violent crime in America and hate crimes are violent crimes. They are also despicable violations, whatever. Okay, that, I, it's okay, whatever. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not dealing with anything from this fake acting attorney general. Okay, all right. And he could be there, he could be there, he could have a shorter tenure than Anthony Scaramucci, who was White House Communications Director for 10 days after he was forced to resign. 
Okay. So let's look at this other article. And uh, everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. If you like this type of information we share with you at the African History Network, uh, you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, okay? And um, you can uh, order our DVD lectures at africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. We have the uh, eight DVD bundle pack, the Africans that were here before Columbus, the Africans that were here before Columbus. We also have the animated series for children, the Mail Trek series, which deals with exploring ancient Africa and exploring pre-Columbian America. And it teaches our history to our children at a young age. And we also have the uh, 47 page full color um, storybook dealing with exploring ancient Africa. And then also we have the coloring book as well. Okay, this is all from the Mail Trek series. So that's available at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And we have those in the bundle pack also. All right. And African-American business owners, post a name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Uh, you can email us at CustomerService at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, CustomerService at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com to find out how to advertise with the African History Network. And uh, with our current promotion, get 50% off the, fir uh, the first month and your second month is free, okay? Get 50% off the first month, the second month is free. We have a special promotion going for a couple more days. Okay, so uh, now Washington Post had an article um, today. I'm sorry, yesterday. A senator refuses to apologize for joking about public hanging in a state known for lynchings. A senator refuses to apologize for public hanging in a state known for lynchings, okay? So uh, she posted, uh, Senator Cindy Highsmith posted a response and uh, it's on Twitter. And she said that uh, the statement from her said, uh, quote, in a comment on the, in a comment on November 2nd, I referred to accepting an invitation to a speaking engagement and referencing the one who invited me. I used an exaggerated expression of regard and any attempt to turn this into a negative connotation is ridiculous. I still don't know what that means. An exaggerated expression of regard. Uh, I still don't understand what that means. Okay. But if we look at this article from um, Washington, Washington Post, number one, Representative Benny Thompson, who's a Democrat from Mississippi, House of Representatives, member of the Congressional Black Caucus, um, he demanded an apology for all Mississippians. Um, and he said, if he invited me to a public hang, I'm sorry, um, in his statement, he, he, released, he released a statement Monday, calling the senator's comments on public hanging, quote, beyond disrespectful and offensive, beyond disrespectful and offensive, adding that Mississippi's history includes, quote, one of the highest numbers of public lynching that we know of than any other state in this country, okay? So, um, Let's see, she appeared in Jackson, Mississippi, the state's capital with Mississippi Governor Phil Bryant, uh, who appointed her uh, after accepting the endorsement from the National Right to Life Committee. Uh, let's see, she refused to, okay. So she refused to elaborate on Monday when reporters asked for more context. In this, and she was in Jackson, Mississippi with the uh, governor, uh, Phil Bryant, who's a Republican, okay. Here is the exchange with the media. I want you to hear this, okay? Here's the exchange with the media. Let's take a listen to this. Yesterday, Let's back it statement. Up. Senator, we put out a statement yesterday, and we stand by that statement. Could you expand on it then, why you said it, what you meant by it, and why people in the state should not see it as offensive? We put out the statement yesterday, and it's available, and we stand by that statement. Senator, are you familiar with Mississippi's history of lynchings? I put out a statement yesterday, and that's all I'm going to say about it. 
Go you mentioned Brian. that there shouldn't be, it shouldn't be viewed with a negative connotation. Could you at, at least explain I how it could be yesterday, <laughs> and we stand by the statement, and that's all I'm going to say about it. Is that phrasing in your everyday lingo, in your vocabulary? You I put out phrase? a statement yesterday. Governor, you appointed her as a United States Senator. You have a huge black population that are looking for answers on why she used that kind of language. And you have worked to try to uh, uh, make it known that Mississippi no longer has that past. Right. When you're hearing her say, I put out a statement yesterday, and that's all. I, I, I think she is, is uh, she's certainly addressing uh, the fact that she has put out a statement. I can tell you all of us in public life have said things on occasion that we could have phrased better. When you make as many speeches as we do in public life, that does occur. But I know this woman and I know her heart. I knew it when I appointed her, I know it now. She meant no offense by that statement. There was nothing in her heart of ill will. Uh, now, in a political campaign, people can make anything you say what they want it to say. They can spit it. They can go on social media and accuse you of all sorts of things. She feels certain that, um, I, I believe I won't speak for her, but that her statement spoke to it. Um, absolutely, we have been sensitive um, to race relations in this state. I brought the president of the United States here to open the Civil Rights Museum. <laughs> and American American leadership that would fail to even come to the event because of... Okay, hold on. <laughs> this, you're not... Hold on. This is the governor. <laughs> this is the governor, Phil Bryant. Wait a second. You're not making things better by saying you brought a white supremacist named Donald Trump to Mississippi for the opening of the Civil Rights Museum. You're not, you're not, you're not helping her at all with this. <laughs> okay, okay, look, look, black people in Mississippi, you can either have Mike Espy as U.S. Senator or you can have a public hanging woman as U.S. Senator, okay? Because one of them is going to be U.S. Senator, okay? You have to figure out which one you want, okay? This is the governor who said, hey, look, I brought the president here for the opening of the Civil Rights Museum. Like, that's actually helping her case, okay? We're going we're gonna to back this up. You have to hear this. This, is, this happened yesterday. There was a press conference. This is from, uh, let's see, this, is, this was put on Twitter. In today's press conference, receiving an endorsement from the National Right to Life president, Senator Hyde Smith was only asked questions regarding her statement on public hangings. This is what she and Governor Phil Bryant had to say. Okay, <laughs> let's, um, let's see, we have Zoom running, so let's blow this up. And let's see if we can, uh, I'm going to share this screen so you can see what's going on. <clears throat> so you can see the video. Because this is crazy. <laughs> All right, so we have to share on. Okay, I'm going to back this. I'm going to back this. Uh, I'm, we're going to back that thing up. We're going to start it from the beginning. <laughs> so you can see this. Put out a statement yesterday, and we stand by that statement. Could you expand on it then, why you said it, what you meant by it, and why people in the state should not see it as offensive. We put out the statement yesterday, and it's available, and we stand by that statement. Is Senator, are you familiar with Mississippi's history, history of lynchings? I put out a statement yesterday, and that's all I'm going to say about it. Governor, you mentioned Brian. that there shouldn't be, it shouldn't be viewed with a negative connotation. Could you at, at least explain how I put out a statement yesterday, positive? and we stand by the statement, and that's all I'm going to say about it. Okay, now hold on. The, the reporter asked her, okay, you said it should not be seen as a negative connotation. Okay, uh, what? Uh, how do you positively use that? I've never heard that phrase before, okay? I'm not from the South, but I know people from the South. I, I never heard that phrase used positively, okay? So <laughs> how do you positively use that phrase about being at a public hanging? Okay, <laughs> let's continue. Is that phrasing in your everyday lingo, in your vocabulary? You I put out phrase? a statement yesterday. Governor, you appointed her as a United States Senator. You have a 
due to black population that are looking for answers on why she used that kind of language. And you have worked to try to uh, uh, make it known that Mississippi no longer has that pattern. Right. When you're hearing her say, I put out a statement yesterday, and that's all. I, I, I think she is, is uh, she's certainly addressing uh, the fact that she has put out a statement. I can tell you all of us in public life have said things on occasion that we could have phrased better. When you make as many speeches as we do in public life, that does occur. But I know this woman and I know her heart. I knew it when I appointed her, I know it now. She meant no offense by that statement. There was nothing in her heart of evil will. Uh, now, in a political campaign, people can make anything you say what they want it to say. They can spit it. They can go on social media and accuse you of all sorts of things. She feels certain that, um, I, I believe I won't speak for her, but that her statement spoke to it. Um, absolutely, we have been sensitive um, to race relations in this state. I brought the president of the United States here to open the Civil Rights Museum. <laughs> and Hold on, wait a second. Would fail. <laughs> wait a second. He talks about being sensitive. He, on, he talks about being sensitive to the way people feel in race relations. And then you bring a white supremacist president who called African-American football players who took a knee to fight against racial injustice and to fight against police brutality. He called them SOBs. This the guy you bring to open the Civil Rights Museum? Again, did Donald Trump, do you understand that Donald Trump in 1973 he and his white supremacist daddy, do you understand they were sued by Richard Nixon's Department of Justice, okay, for discriminating against African-Americans and Hispanics when it came to renting uh, apartments to them in Manhattan? They settled out of court. Then they were sued three years after that because they kept doing it. And they were in violation of the Fair Housing Act of 1968, which comes out of the civil rights movement. And this is the guy you bring to open the, the, the civil rights museum. Mr. Mr. There were good people on both sides when he talks about the Charlottesville attack. Oh, what do you, this is the governor of Mississippi. Let's continue. At African American leadership, it would fail to even come to the event because the president of the United States was there. Today I talked about the Okay, let me back it up a little bit. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> okay, you, you remember uh what was that? Who wants to be a millionaire? Phone a friend. Remember that? You know, you know, you you have the lifeline, you want to phone a friend. She probably wanted to phone a friend. This is going to be now this now, Southwest Airlines. This would be a good commercial for Southwest Airlines. You know, you know, they say you want to get away. She she probably wants to get away right now. This would be a good commercial for Southwest Airlines come to the event because the president of the United States was there. Today I talked about the genocide. Well, hold on, I ain't backed it up enough. Hold on, sorry. I brought the president of the United States here to open the Civil Rights Museum. And African American leadership that would fail to even come to the event because the president of the United States was there. Today I talked about the genocide of over 20 million African American children. See, in my heart, I am confused about where the outrage is at, about 20 million African-American children that have been aborted. No one wants to say anything about that. No one wants to talk about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, this is what happens when you get... To, this is an example of how elections have consequences. This is the governor of, of, of Mississippi, Phil Bryant. Totally out of touch. See, and this is how a lot of these white evangelical Republican Christians, right? They just want to deal with abortions. They don't want to deal with criminal justice reform, many of them. They don't want to deal with um, uh, police bias, uh, uh, implicit bias in policing. They don't want to deal with any of that. Some of these same people will chastise Colin Kaepernick and Eric Reed and others for taking a knee, protesting. Uh, during the national anthem, even though taking a knee comes from the military, that they say they love so much, except for Trump, because when Trump, it, Trump got fired deferments because he was too much of a coward to go fight in the military and fight in Vietnam, okay? But just 
just look at just look at what happened in the, these two minutes and 20 seconds. And the governor did her more harm than she did uh, in this press conference. This was the governor who appointed her who said this. He talked about how African-American leaders there in Mississippi did not want to attend the opening of the Civil Rights Museum of Mississippi because the governor invited Donald Trump, who basically is anti-civil rights. Let's be clear. When you, when you nominate someone like Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III to be your attorney general, and he's the top cop in the country, and the department and, 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 and the FBI reports to the Department of Justice. The uh, um, DEA reports to the Department of Justice. The Bureau of Prisons reports to the Department of Justice. Homeland Security, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, the ATF. All these entities report to Jeff Sessions. And Jeff Sessions cheered the gutting of the, of the Voting Rights Act in 2013. 1986, when Jeff Sessions was going through the confirmation hearing in the US Senate, to become a federal judge, he was deemed too racist to be a federal judge. Coretta Scott King wrote an eight or nine page letter, submitted, submitted it to the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee, the Confirmation Committee, and said that um, if Jeff Sessions became a federal judge, it will undo Dr. King's legacy. So Trump is not a champion of civil rights by any stretch of the imagination. OK, all we have to do is look and see who he nominated. Look at look at the people around him. So when you are when you're the governor. Of Mississippi. And you appointed this woman. Cindy Hyde Smith, and you tried to save her, then talking about you inviting Donald Trump to the opening of the Civil Rights Museum. Keep in mind, Donald Trump is the same guy who took out a full page ad in four New York City newspapers calling for the death penalty to be brought back so that the Central Park Five would be executed. Then in 2016, towards the end of the campaign, Trump was asked about it because these guys years later were exonerated. DNA evidence cleared them. The real culprit was, was arrested and is in prison. OK, the real culprit is in prison. Donald Trump still did not concede that he made a mistake. He did not retract those statements. He did not apologize. They have been exonerated. Trump said they didn't deserve the millions of dollars and, and uh, that they were paid uh, from a lawsuit, things like this. This is who you invite to the opening of the Civil Rights Museum. And then for the governor to then bring that up to to try to exonerate the statements that she made shows they're both tone deaf. Shows they're both tone deaf. So this is an example of how elections have consequences. Okay, keep in mind, November 27th, runoff election in Mississippi between Mike Espy, the African-American candidate, Democrat, and I'm neither Democrat nor Republican, those who watch my broadcast and listen to my show, you know this. Or this woman, the hanging woman. One of them is gonna be, one of them is going to uh, be a member of the US Senate. One, two, whoever it is, your taxpayer dollars are gonna pay for it. This is what people don't understand when they say, oh, we shouldn't vote, blah, blah, blah regardless of whether you vote or not, if you pay taxes, your taxpayer dollars are going to pay their salary. Whatever policies that they vote on and get written into law, that pass and get written into law, your taxpayer dollars are going to pay for those policies, whether they're good or bad, whether they help you or hurt you. This is why we have to think strategically. We have to be more strategic when it comes to voting and understand in each election, you may not get everything you want, but also we have to understand the concept of political self-defense, which is a, a term I've coined. And we have to understand how to block people out of certain positions from doing us more harm also. <clears throat> this is something a lot of us don't understand. All right, let's go to, um, okay, so that right there, that's hilarious, okay? <laughs> but this is the tone deafness, this is Mississippi. 
This is not Mississippi in 1965. This was yesterday. This, this, this video, this press conference took place November 12th, 2018. That's what's going on right now in Mississippi. <laughs> it's okay. You, you can not vote if you want to. <laughs> this, this is what you're going to get. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's continue here. Let me stop the uh, let me stop the share. Let's flip back over. All right, and uh, internet on the phone's running slow. I'm trying to monitor this, so um, we we'll try to get to some of your comments here. But she still refuses to apologize. Now I think maybe after this video circulates, maybe she'll apologize. Uh, <laughs> Okay, but once again, when we look at the history of Mississippi, and the article from the uh, Washington Post lays out some of the history, and I went and looked at the uh, NAACP's website, because they have uh, the information there, history of lynchings, is at NAACP.org, and there's a link in the NBCnews.com uh, article, and a link in the uh, article from the Washington Post um dealing with this okay it has a link to the NAACP page history of links lynchings at NAACP.org throughout the late 19th century racial tension grew throughout the United States more of this tension was noticeable in the southern parts of the United States in the south people were blaming their financial problems on the newly freed slaves that lived around them that's like white people blaming immigrants coming to this country for their financial problems. Because see, when you study the history of all this, we've seen this before. Go, go research the Know Nothing Party. They were, called, they were called the American Party or Nativists. And they were ostensibly called the Know Nothing Party. They existed in the 1830s and 1840s. And they were a bunch of poor white people who were largely blaming immigrants for taking their jobs. They were called the Know Nothing Party. Lynchings were becoming a popular way of resolving some of the anger that whites had in relation to the free blacks. From 1882 to 1968, 4,743 lynchings occurred in, in the United States. Of these people that were lynched, 3,446 were African American or black. The blacks lynched accounted for 72.7% of the people lynched. These numbers seem large, but it is known that not all of the lynchings were ever recorded, which is true. Out of the 4,743 people lynched, only 1,297 white people were lynched because a lot of these lynchings were done by the Ku Klux Klan and Ku Klux Klan-like groups. And they were not just attacking African Americans, but they were attacking Republicans and white Republicans, okay? Because these are, these are largely Southern states, Southerners, and they saw the Republicans, the Northerners as the enemy and the cause of the Civil War, which goes through and destroys, you know, largely destroys the South and just totally destroys their way of life. Now that is only, so the 1,297, white people who are lynched. That is only 27.3%. Many of the whites uh, were lynched for helping the African-Americans or being anti-lynching and even for domestic crimes. Was lynching necessary? The um, segment from the NAACP asked. To many people, it was not. But to the whites in the late 19th century, it served a purpose. Whites started lynching because they felt it was necessary to protect white women. And see, I deal with this when I deal with like the history of after the Civil War, things like this. Rape, though, was not a great factor in reasoning behind the lynching. It was the third greatest cause of lynchings behind homicides and all other causes. Let me repeat that. To many people, 
lynching was not necessary, but to white people in the late 19th century, it served a purpose. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whites, whites started lynching because they felt it was necessary to protect white women. Rape, though, was not a great factor in reasoning behind the lynching. It was the third greatest cause of lynchings behind homicides and all other causes. Most of the lynchings that took place happened in the South. A big reason for this was the end of the Civil War. Once African-Americans were given their freedom, many people felt that the freed, uh, freed Blacks, the former slaves, were getting away with too much freedom and felt they needed to be controlled. Mississippi had the highest lynchings from 1882 to 1968 with 581. Georgia, where Stacey Abrams is now, trying to fight for a runoff between Brian Kemp, a staunch Donald Trump supporter, Georgia had the second highest number of lynchings in this country at 531 from 1882 to 1968. And Texas had the third highest number of lynchings at 493. 79% of lynchings happened in the South because that's what the majority of African-Americans were, okay? Uh, especially prior to the Great Migration, okay? Now you're gonna have six to seven million African-Americans who migrate from the South up North between 1915 and 1970. Now of the lynchings that did not take place in the South, mainly in the West, were normally lynchings of whites, not African-Americans. Of the lynchings that did not take place in the South, mainly in the West, they were normally lynchings of whites, not African-Americans. Most of the lynching in the West came from the lynching of either murderers or cattle thieves. And you, if you watch old Westerns, things like this, you'll see this depicted, the hangings, okay? Clint Eastwood, hang them high, things like this. When you watch the old westerns, you'll see those are lynchings. Now they call them they may have call, they call them hangings, but those are lynchings also. That's a that's a type of lynching as well. Most of the lynching in the West came from the lynching of either murderers or cattle thieves. There really was no political link to the lynching of blacks in the South and whites in the West. These were just un, they, these were unjust killing because a lot of the uh, a lot of those lynchings or a lot of those hangings, they were like vigilant, like out West, murderers and cattle thieves. They were vigilantes that would hunt them down and hang them. They weren't tried and convicted, things like this. It wasn't a public, it wasn't a government execution. There really was no political link in, uh, no political link to the lynching of blacks in the South and whites in the West. Not all states did lynch people. Not all states did lynch people. Some states did not lynch a white or African-American. Alaska, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Connecticut were these few states that had no lynchings between 1882 to 1968. Although some states did have lynchings, some of them did not lynch any African-Americans. Arizona, Idaho, Maine, Nevada, South Dakota, Vermont, and Wisconsin were some states that did not lynch any African Americans to record. Okay, Arizona, Idaho, Maine, Nevada, South Dakota, Vermont, and Wisconsin. Quite a few states did, in fact, lynch more white people than African Americans. In the West, these great, these greater number of white lynchings was due to political reasons, not racial reasons. California, Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Michigan, where I live, Minnesota, Montana, Nebraska, New Mexico, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Oregon, Oregon, Utah, Washington, and Wyoming lynched more whites than African-Americans, okay? They lynched more whites than African-Americans. It's sad to think that we look at other countries and deem them immoral for killing their own people, but we overlook the fact 
of what happened in the late 1890s to the late 1960s. This is something that we cannot overlook and do not need and, and do not need to try to overlook it. Okay. And this is um, from um, NAACP's uh, website, NAACP.org. Uh, we'll post this link here on the thread of the broadcast. All right. Okay, so you can check out the rest of that. Okay, so if we um, go back to the article from Washington Post, a senator refuses to apologize for joking about public hanging in a state known for lynchings, okay? Um, okay, so Mike Espy and uh, Cindy Hyde-Smith had the top two vote tallies, each receiving about 41% of the vote. If Espy were to win, he would become the first African-American senator to represent the state of Mississippi since the Reconstruction era. Reconstruction ended in 18, 1877. Mike Espy served three terms in the House of Representatives from, 18, from 1987 to 1993. All right, let me look at some more of this here. Okay, so. Check out the um, check out the rest of this article here. Okay, this is from uh, Washington Post. That's from November twelfth. A senator refuses to apologize for joking about public hanging in the state known for lynchings. And this is an example of how elections have consequences. Now she was appointed by the governor to 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 carry out the rest of um, Senator uh, Thack, um, uh, uh, the previous senator. But uh, now you have an opportunity to actually vote. People in uh, Thad Cochran, yeah. Republican Senator Thad Cochran, she finished his term. All right. Let's look at some of your comments here. And African-American business owners, hey, you can advertise with the African History Network. Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com, customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. We, um, we take your 30-second or 60-second commercial, put it into the audio podcast of our Sunday night show, the African History Network show, and some of the broadcasts we do throughout the week. Each episode reach thousands of people across the country. We're on six different podcast platforms. We're on uh, iTunes, we're on Blog Talk Radio, we're on CastBox, FM Player, TuneIn.com, the name of few. Okay. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Our current promotion, get 50% off your first month and your second month is free. Okay. So Dale Smith said, wow, your taxpayer dollars will pay for policies whether you vote or not. Good stuff. That's true. People don't understand that. Your taxpayer dollars pay for the elected officials you hate who are screwing you over, and they pay for the ones you like. Whether you voted for them or not, they pay for their salaries, they pay for the, po you pay for the policies. So in a lot of these cities, like Detroit, when city council gave $334 million in tax breaks to the Illiches to build Little Caesars Arena, that come, that's on the back of taxpayers. That's on the back of taxpayers. Okay, if even if you didn't vote for anybody on city council, your taxpayer dollars are being used against you. When, you, when, when we have gentrification going on, and that's part of gentrification, that little Caesars arena. When you have gentrification going on in these cities, our taxpayer dollars are paying for us to be gentrified out of these cities. So election day is your opportunity to fire a lot of these people who have been screwing you over. This is how we have to understand this. We have to think more strategically. So Kim Robinson said, I'm sick of fake apologies. Yeah, me too, but there, there's no apology here. There's absolutely no apology here. So <laughs> Morris uh, Reed said, maybe don't lynch. They beat African-Americans. C. Mac said, um, these old people have no filter. They're dead serious. Um, I. Ray said, true. 
Paxton said, this is so sad. Solomon said, respect. Rena, interesting. Paxton removed races out of position of power. Okay. Yeah, this is going on right now. <laughs> this is going on right now, 2018. Okay, and then uh, thinkprogress.org had an article also. Mississippi Senator insists public hanging joke was merely an exaggerated expression of regard. Okay, uh, her black opponent disagrees. That's from November 12, 2018. That's from thinkprogress.org also. All right. Okay, everybody. Um, also, you know, we have our eight DVD uh, bundle pack. We have uh, the Africans that were here before Columbus, the Africans that were here before Columbus. And October, you know, in October, you had Columbus Day, October 12th, and it was celebrated either that Monday, October 9th or 8th. And a lot of people don't know the history of the African presence in this country going back tens of thousands of years, going back at least 51,700 years. So there's a double lecture that I did with Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. He wrote this book, which is a groundbreaking book. And he talks about how he stands on the shoulders of Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. We have a, a lecture from Dr. Ivan Van Sertema who wrote, um, They Came Before Columbus. We have a um, lecture from Dr. John Henry Clark, Christopher Columbus and African Holocaust. We have a double lecture I did dealing with Christopher Columbus as well as uh, the history of Halloween, because October 31st was Halloween as well. Okay, so it's an eight DVD bundle pack, the, uh, the Africans that were here before Columbus, it's uh, on sale $70. We have those shipping out this week. That's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com also. Okay, Pat said, got it, okay. The movement to boycott Black Friday, Black Monday, Black Money Does Matter, Quincy Norris. So on Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, we need to redirect dollars to African-American-owned businesses on Black Friday. We need to redirect dollars to African-American-owned businesses on that day. Absolutely. And that whole weekend, going into Small Business Saturday, going into uh, Cyber Monday, we need to redirect dollars to African-American-owned businesses. Now, those in Detroit, I'll be at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African-American History, uh, the day after Thanksgiving for their, uh, they have a Black Friday uh, business expo and things like this. So I'll be there for that. So you'll hear more about that. Uh, I think that's going on from like 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. That's on the 30th, November 30th, that Friday. Okay. Let's look at some more of your comments. Okay, Anita Kent said, great book. Yeah, the first Americans were Africans. Absolutely. And I talked to Dr. David M. Hotep. Uh, he emailed me a few days ago because he's working. He's in the final stages of this new book. Um, the Africans, the, um, they, the African, was it? Uh, the first Americans were Africans um, revisited. It's going to have about 200 additional pages. So that's coming out uh, this late this month. He said, um, when I talked to him, in October, he said it would be between Halloween and Thanksgiving it would come out. So Thanksgiving is on the 29th, and I talked to him um, a few days ago, and he's in the final stages. It's like 480 pages, the book. So look out for that in the next couple of weeks also. All right. Rena said, any half-assed attempt of an apology would not be heartfelt or meaningful. This United States Senator has told us in front of the media who and what she is, be mindful that there are many more like her. That's true, that's true. And see, what's so insidious about this is they draft policy that impacts all of us and laws and they vote on them. This is what we have to understand, but not only that, they vote on Supreme Court justices. They vote to confirm Supreme Court justices. They vote, vote to cons confirm federal judges. So there are about 107 vacancies on the federal court level for judges 
when Trump became president. He's made about 145 nominations. Now, all of them were not approved, okay? But, uh, okay, sorry, Thanksgiving is, uh, I thought that was late. Thanksgiving is November 22nd. Yeah, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong week. Yeah, I'll be there at the Charles E. Wright Museum November 23rd. Yeah, Thanksgiving is November 22nd, the fourth Thursday. Yeah, I'll be at the Charles E. Wright Museum November 23rd. So yeah, his book is coming out. If, it, if it's still coming out by Thanksgiving and it's coming out in the next few days, I have to check with him. I know he was uh, he was having some problems with the editing, with the formatting. So we'll see, but probably sometime this month, it, uh, it will come out. What's the name of the book again? The First Americans. Well, this one here, his first book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. This is out of print. You can, I think you can still get it, however, on Amazon Kindle. Because on Amazon, it's about three or $400. But on Amazon Kindle, it's probably $15. So you could probably still get it on Amazon Kindle, okay? And his new book is The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. All right, now, I also teach online courses and we have them all on demand. So if you wanna learn more about this history, uh, et cetera, uh, we have a 10 course online bundle pack, a 10 course online bundle pack. I'm the one teaching the courses. Uh, and it, it includes ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So Kemet is one of the uh, original names for Egypt. Uh, Egypt is not a term that we use. Um, and we know that August 20, and we know that for 2019, you're going to see a lot of commemorations commemorating the 400th year anniversary of African people first coming to this land we call the United States of America in Jamestown, Virginia, August 20th, 1619. Now, even though August 20th, 1619 did happen, we were here for tens of thousands of years before that. This was our land stolen from us. We were here before Native Americans came into existence. And this is the type of information I deal with in the online courses that I teach because um, the Ma'afa is a key Swahili word or Swahili word, which means the great disaster that deals with our Holocaust, the transatlantic slave trade. So I deal with things chronologically. I don't start in the late 1400s with the transatlantic slave trade or something like that. We did we do with thousands of tens of thousands of years of history. We do with ancient Egypt. We talk about the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who helped to bring Europe out of the dark ages. And we deal with Christopher Columbus and we deal with how Columbus lays the foundation for slavery, racism, the uh, exploitation of indigenous people, things like this. So you have to deal with it chronologically, okay? So when we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the original people of North, Central, and South America. This is what Dr. David M. Hotel deals with in his book. I use this book as one of the references for the online course that I teach. And we have been in the U.S. at least 51,700 years. And we're talking about the Khoisan, who come from Southern Africa. They have the oldest DNA on the planet. They're the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. They go all around the world, and they were here in this land also. They were building pyramid mounds up and down the Mississippi River. Okay, so this is a history that they don't teach in a lot of our schools. So we can't start studying our history in slavery. Even when we study the transatlantic slave trade, which is important to study, we can't start in 1619 or in the 1440s when the Portuguese get involved, because the Portuguese are the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade. We have to understand the history chronologically and deal with the 800 year occupation of the Africans known as the Moors, who entered the Iberian Peninsula, today known as Spain and Portugal from North Africa, going from Morocco especially, in 711 AD, okay? So this is some of the history we deal with in the online course. I'll do a PowerPoint presentation 
We have video clips, all that included. So the 10 course online bundle pack is on sale for a limited time only, $60, regularly $130. It also includes an online class I did dealing with the film Black Panther. Uh, we know Stan Lee passed away yesterday, co-creator of Black Panther, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby created the Black Panther in July, 1966. That's when he um, uh, first appeared in Marvel Comics, it was in issue 52 of the Fantastic Four um, comic book that, that introduced the Black Panther. So we, it includes great athletes from women in history, the mothers of civilization, and um, a lot of other uh, online courses I've done also. You can watch from around the world. They're all on demand. Watch at your own pace. Uh, so we just posted the link here, and it's also at africanhistorynetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com okay and this helps support the african history network helps us to keep doing the research pay the bills stay on the air uh do the um do our sunday night radio show the african history network show all of that okay that helps me to, to be able to finance all of this okay and you can also donate to the african history network paypal.me forward slash the ahn show paypal.me forward slash the ahn show those in Georgia, if there's a runoff election between uh, Stacey Abrams and uh, Kemp, Brian Kemp, we have to turn out, we have to show up once again for Stacey Abrams. Seriously. Now, some people say, somebody commented on Facebook. They say, oh, I went to her website and she doesn't say anything about black people on the website. Okay, let's deal with this. Cause some of us, some of us, I don't know where we come up with this stuff from. Go to her website, stacyabrams.com and click on issues. And look at her policies. Almost all of her policies, if not all of them, impact African-Americans. See, they don't have to, now some people say, okay, the candidate has to have a black agenda. The candidate has to have a black agenda. A black agenda is something that African-American organizations present to the candidate. That's not something we wait for them to present to us. What's more important than on the website saying black agenda is for them to have the policies that were in the black agenda on the website. It doesn't have to say black. It depends upon the circumstances. In Georgia, which is like 59% white, in Georgia, had the most number of lynchings in the, the most number of lynchings from 1882 to 1968. Georgia is one of the former Confederate states. Right now in Georgia, they have a huge, they have Stone Mountain in Georgia. I've been to the top of Stone Mountain. I've climbed up Stone Mountain in Georgia. Anybody in Georgia knows what I'm talking about. On the side of the, on the side of the mountain, they have carved into the mountain three traitors to the Union. Who, were, who are Confederate heroes who fought to maintain slavery and took up arms against the US. General Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, who is the president of the Confederacy and PGT Beauregard. I'm not talking about what was there in 50 years ago. I'm talking about that's there right now in Georgia. Anybody watching this in Georgia knows what I'm talking about in Stone Mountain. It's called Stone Mountain. It's in Stone Mountain, Georgia. I've seen it. Not only that, they turned Stone Mountain into an amusement park. I've been to the amusement park at Stone Mountain. They have all types of rides, things like this. When you get to the top of Stone Mountain, there's a souvenir shop. In the souvenir shop, on almost all of the souvenir, their knit hats, their mug warmers, their mugs, their pennants, their keychains. Their glasses is the is, is 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 the picture of these three Confederate heroes who were traitors to the Union who fought to maintain slavery. That's there right now. I was there in July 2017. We were filming um, the third installment of the film Black Friday, the director Rick Mathis, and I'm in the film. So we filmed my portion of it. We were sitting at the top of Stone Mountain. And that's the first time 
I, you know, I had passed by it before in my previous trips to Atlanta. That's the first time I've actually been there. And I'm I'm blown away. I'm like, damn, this is here in this is here in 2017. It's still there right now. So this is the environment. And also, by the way, Georgia is a red state. Also, Georgia is a state that Donald Trump won in 2016. So this is the environment that Stacey Abrams is running in. So on her website, that this is real talk, because this is something people don't want to tell you. On her website, if she wants to win, uh, it shouldn't say black agenda. It should just have policies that positively impact African Americans. If she wants to win, that's that's the environment that she's running in. Now, all the people to say, "Oh, well, Stacey, uh, you know, uh, Stacey Abrams don't have anything for black people." Blah blah blah. Read her policies. One, two. Go read Brian Kemp's policies and see what he has for you. Because, see, that's what people don't want to talk about. One of them is going to be governor. Your taxpayer dollars are going to pay their salaries. Not only that, the policies they implement, your taxpayer dollars are going to finance that. So whose policies will best positively impact the African-American community? Go read their policies. It's about policy. It's not about party affiliation. It's not about personality. She deals with, she talks about affordable housing, education, energy and environment, equal rights, gun safety, health care, jobs, economy, and infrastructure, criminal justice. Criminal justice definitely don't have nothing to do with black people. Because it, it, it must not, because it doesn't say black people. So it must not have anything to do with this. As Governor Stacey will. One, promote effective community policing to build trust and keep communities safe. Two, advance criminal justice reform through the elimination of cash bail, fines rather than jail time for small amounts of marijuana, and increase diversion and reentry program. Well, Black people don't smoke marijuana, so they don't have nothing to do with us. And we don't go to jail, so eliminating cash bail, they don't have nothing to do with us. Okay? Stacy's record served on the Special Joint Committee on Criminal Justice Reform, the Sentencing Subcommittee, Probation Reform Task Force, and the Special Counsel on Criminal Justice Reform for Georgians. She helped pass changes to reform private probation, improve our parole system, quote, ban the box, end quote, and juvenile justice reforms. She was appointed to the Judicial Nominating Committee and advocated for true diversity over representation in our courts. But we don't have to worry because black people don't go to prison. We don't have to worry about cash bail. See, this is see, this is an exact, this is what I'm trying to explain to people. Okay. And I'm somebody uh, who's been involved in writing public policy for the city of Detroit. Okay, in the Kwame Kilpatrick administration. I ain't working the administration. Okay, I was managing a construction trades program through a local community college. And I was able to get us in a position and we were on the committee to write executive order 22 that dealt with restriction that, that dealt with um, policies dealing with having Detroiters working on construction projects in the city of Detroit that were funded by the city of Detroit that now that excluded road construction but i was on that committee okay so in detroit is 80 percent at the time detroit was like about 85 percent african-american it's 80 percent african-american now but when you understand policy these policies are either going to positively impact you or negatively impact you they don't have to say black white african-american they don't have to say none of that so this is why when we when we go read these policies at her platform on, on her website, go read the policies at Brian Kemp's website as well. I guarantee you hers are gonna be a whole lot better for us. One of the things she wants to do is to keep the tax credits for to film for, for the film companies that film TV shows and movies in Georgia, because Georgia is looked at as a Southern Hollywood. They generate not about $9.5 billion for the Georgian economy. 
they employ a lot of African Americans. The movie Black Panther pumped around $89 million into the Georgia economy. Why? A lot of that movie was filmed in Atlanta at Tyler Perry Studios, the film Black Panther. A lot of people don't know this. Atlanta, Georgia, in one way, is like Wakanda. Because <laughs> a lot of the movie Black Panther was filmed in Atlanta. The movie employed about 3,000 people in Georgia. A lot of them were African-Americans, okay? People in Georgia know about this. Um, and Tyler Perry talked about this on his uh, Instagram page, okay? And there was an article from uh, Deadline, Deadline.com. Black Panther generates $89.3 million for Georgia economy. Yeah, Deadline.com talked about this. Now, Brian Kemp wants to take away the tax credits and things like that. They did that here. This is what Governor Snyder did here in Michigan, and it dried up because in Michigan, because the gov Governor Granholm, the former governor, you had these tax credits, these tax breaks under her, which gave incentives for film companies to film movies here in Michigan. And a lot of them were filmed here in Detroit. And it provided a lot of jobs for people, even though they were temporary jobs, but people who were into acting, people who provided catering services, limousine services, executive protection, it, 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 it helped fuel an economy, okay? This is how policies impact people's businesses. This is how policies impact industries. Governor Snyder comes in, Republican governor, he does away with that. A lot of that dries up, if not all of it, dries up. This is what Kemp, Kemp wants to take that away in Georgia. Stacey Abrams wants to keep it. This deals with, see, Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Policies that are written impact the business community, impact the business climate. And people have to understand the relationship between the two of them, because a lot of people don't understand the relationship. If you look at uh, Stacey Abrams' platform on jobs, freedom and the opportunity to thrive for all Georgians in every region in our state. Um, Stacey Abrams is dedicated to building an economy that works in all 159 Georgia counties for every Georgian and helps families thrive. Georgia, Georgia is often said to be the number one place to do business. We must also strive to be the number one place to work, raise a family and retire. Our state will deliver high quality employment by investing in small businesses and the assets that all businesses need, like an educated workforce and strong infrastructure in urban, suburban, and rural areas alike. So today, Jeff Bezos announced where the two new headquarters of Amazon are gonna be. Detroit put in a bid for the Amazon headquarters to be in Detroit. The main reason why Detroit did not get the bid was because lack of mass public transit, okay? And also the roads are bad in Detroit also, which goes to infrastructure. So all of that plays a part in attracting business to a state or a city. Gretchen Whitmer, who just became, who just won the, uh, the governor's race, she's a Democrat, one of the platforms she ran on was fixing the damn roads. This is what she actually said in her commercials, fix the damn roads, because Michigan has horrible roads. Because we're in the north, we're near the water, at least Detroit, but a lot, a lot of Michigan. But because of the cold weather, it causes, the cold weather causes the roads to contract. And then they thaw out, they expand, and it causes the potholes. It causes the roads to, uh, to be terrible, the huge potholes, things like this in the roads. Um, 
So our state will deliver high quality employment by investing in small businesses and the assets that all businesses need, like an educated workforce and strong infrastructure in suburban, urban, and rural areas alike. Stacy's committed to lifting up all Georgians and will promote policies that support more that will that support workers, remove barriers to opportunity, and foster prosperity for every family in Georgia. As governor, Stacy will one, keep more money in the pockets of working families through the Georgia Earned Income Tax Credit and the Cradle to Career Savings Program. All this is policy. Taxpayer dollars pay for all of these policies, okay? Now, do you, you want your taxpayer dollars to pay for her policies or pay for Brian Kemp's policies? Even if you don't vote as a Georgian, even if you don't vote, your taxpayer dollars are gonna pay for one of their policies and pay their salaries. We have to think strategically. Two, as governor, Stacey will generate thousands of long-term, good-paying jobs through small business capital programs, clean energy investment, and Medicaid expansion. A policy does not have to say Black or African-American to benefit you. This is what we have to understand. And I'm all for having a Black agenda. A Black agenda is what we present to the candidate. It's not what they present to us. In a state like Georgia, on her website, it shouldn't say black. You understand the history of Georgia? But the policies that benefit us, the policies that we advocate for, should be on her platform. It don't have to say black or African American. And people should download this right here. This is from the Congressional Black Caucus. You heard me talk about it before. I deal with this in some of my presentations. Nobody has seen it. We have a lot to lose. Solutions to advance the uh, solutions to advance black families in the 21st century. So when they met with the Trump administration, March of 2017, they didn't sit there and wait for Trump to present a black agenda to them. They presented a 125 page black agenda to Trump. In here, the first thing it does on page eight is lay out history, dealing with African-Americans to deal with how we got into this predicament. Then it lays out problems in our community dealing with voting rights, criminal justice reform, economic justice, education, workforce, healthcare, environmental justice, rural America, because a lot of African-Americans live in rural America now. Then it lays out actual policies it lays out actual policies, many of these policies written by members of the Congressional Black Caucus, it lays out actual policies to address the conditions that we're complaining about. And as I've said before, now you can download this from cbc.house.gov. I'll post the link here. You can download this from cbc.house.gov. Most of our people don't even know about this. And you don't have to like the Congressional Black Caucus. You don't have to like any of the members of the Congressional Black Caucus. You don't even have to like everything that's in here. But I guarantee you go through and look at it. They have information, they have policies that every African-American organization across the country can utilize as part of their platform to push this agenda, to push these various initiatives, to push these policies to elected officials on a local, state, and national level to push for these policies to be enacted. Uh, let's see here. We'll post this here. Uh, so I downloaded the PDF and went and got it printed up. Okay, so we'll post that link here. That says cbc.house.gov. That's the official website of the Congressional Black Caucus. So some people talk about Dr. Claude Anderson. Dr. Claude Anderson is one of my teachers. I just interviewed him October 28th. You can go watch the broadcast here on Facebook. Follow us at the African History Network on Facebook. Click on videos. You can watch it. It's also in audio podcast form. Um, blog talk radio. Uh, you visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Click on listen to podcasts. People talk about Poweronomics. Okay. You can take the elements from Poweronomics that 
pertain to your city or your state and present that to elected officials and say, this is our black agenda for this city, this state, where do you stand on these issues? Look and see how their policies align with your agenda. Now, if you don't have an agenda, then you just out here floating around, just, I don't know what you're doing, flopping around, whatever, because everybody else is operating based upon an agenda. But to be able to put together the agenda, they have to understand their history and understand their culture. This is why um, with the Congressional Black Caucus, they start out with history of what happened to us in this country before they get to the problems. All right. So we'll post this link here, Stacey Abrams' website. Go look at Brian Kemp's website also, because your taxpayer dollars are gonna pay for either one, uh, either one's uh, programs. And see, based upon our issues, based upon um, your interests, based upon what benefits the African American community, see whose policies are the best. You may not get everything you want, and 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 you're not going to reverse 400 years of oppression with one administration either. That we need to get that out of our minds. It ain't going to work. And those who want to advocate for reparations, we need to advocate a legal argument for reparations. Those who want to advocate for reparations, you need to advocate a legal argument for reparations. Now, just because a candidate, oftentimes, depend upon the candidate and the environment, because um, even the people who advocate for reparations, most of them don't have a real legal argument for it. It's an emotional argument. They say we were enslaved for 246 years and suffered you know, decades of Jim Crow segregation and redlining and things like this, and you owe us $14 trillion and we want it in small bills. That's not a legal argument, because if you study the history of slavery, uh, at least my study of it, you weren't supposed to get paid. If you study the history of slavery in this country, it was legal to enslave us. I'm not saying it was right, it was morally wrong, but it was legal. And based upon my study of it, you weren't supposed to get paid. So arguing that you owe us $14 trillion for for being enslaved is not a legal argument. That's why it hadn't gone. That's why that's why it hasn't gone anywhere. That's not a legal argument. If you want to make a legal argument, then you can say, well, wait a second. In eighteen in, in eighteen oh seven, the U.S. Congress passed U.S. Congress passed a law that went into effect January first of eighteen oh eight that made it illegal to bring Africans into this country as slaves. Now that happened. That ended. The, that ended the international slave trade in this country, okay? That made it illegal. Now, they still kept bringing Africans into this country and enslaving them. Therefore, from 1808 on to about 1860, when they stopped doing it, because that's the year before the Civil War, now all the Africans that were brought in, now the U.S., now they're violating their own law. Now you have a legal argument. Now you have a legal argument because now they're violating their own law. Prior to that, it was legal. So you don't have a legal argument. The other legal argument is to enforce the Black Freeman Indian Treaties of 1866. And I know Dr. Carl Anderson is working on that. I've interviewed him. He's one of my teachers. We talked about that. And we talked about the mistakes he made with it also. Okay. He's talked about that on my show. But the Black Freeman Indian Treaties of 1866 is a legal argument for compensation based upon the treaties signed between the Choctaw, Chick Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians in the United States to give compensation to the slaves, to the African slaves that these five civilized tribes of Native Americans owned. And they got free land, they got compensation, they got uh, money from the government, et cetera. But these five civilized tribes of Native Americans are still receiving compensation from the government today. And uh, our ancestors were pushed out of these treaties basically in 1941, largely. Pushed out of these treaties in 1941. 
just in the last couple of years, the black freedmen of the Cherokee Nation, they were able, they, they, they sued back in 2011 and they were able to, uh, they won their lawsuit. They were able to get full uh, rights and full membership into the Cherokee Nation. Okay, now I'm not sure about the funding from the Black Freeman Indian Treaty. I don't know if they're getting that. But that's a legal argument. Okay? A lot of the arguments that are taking place for reparations are not legal arguments. They are moral arguments. You don't go to a legal court to make a moral argument. So we have to understand the difference. Okay? All right. Okay, who else we have here? Erica Watson, Renee, Tamara, Kim. Thanks for sharing. Okay, guys, look, we got to get out of here. Hey, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And uh, you can donate to the African History Network if you like this type of information, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. That helps us to keep doing what we do, keep doing the research, keep educating, empowering, inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Uh, helps us keep broadcasting our show. You can order our DVD lectures. If you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, Kwanzaa is coming up. African American History Month is coming up in February, January, Dr. King Day. If you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, email me at uh, info at africanhistorynetwork.com. Info at africanhistorynetwork.com. Okay. You want me to do a presentation for your group or organization? And I have presentations on the history of Christmas, Kwanzaa. I have presentations on all this stuff. Dr. King, uh, the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the revolutionary, will not be televised on the television. That's my presentation on Dr. King. I have present presentation on Malcolm X. Um, I have a presentation dealing with the history of African American History Month and dispelling myths in our history. So all these things I have presentations on. Okay, Sunday night, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show. We're on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation. Uh, visit africanhistorynetwork.com for more information on how to listen, how to watch. And uh, all those shows are podcasted at africanhistorynetwork.com. And, and uh, where you, wherever you get your podcast from, just search for the African History Network show. Register for the online courses that I teach. They're all on demand. Watch at your own pace. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We have that 10-course online bundle pack on sale right now, $60. Regularly, um, $60, regularly uh, $130, okay? All right, and I'll talk to you all later. Remember, right now is correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. Talk to you next time. Peace.